All right, so um, as you might have gathered, folks, we're, we're transitioning here. This is the, the, one of the interesting things about this particular show is that it goes from uh, you know, being a combination of, if you like, the technology that's affecting the existing incumbents, the, the financial players, the kind of fintech conversation that we, we didn't exactly start the day with. I like the fact we started the day with, with you know, a crypto conversation. But then we had a couple of hours thinking about what's happening in terms of the incumbents, the, the, the banks, how we are accessing existing financial services, how existing merchants are using new technologies and the like. But you know, the, the rest of the afternoon is, is, is a different story. It's a it's quite different story. And it's one that um, I, I've sort of been involved in quite a lot. This is the crypto world. And the crypto world thinks about things quite differently. Um, hopefully, you, some of you were here for this conversation this morning. Um, and we had uh, the, the panel here. And you had uh, Akin Sawyer there talking about the idea that we need a decentralized architecture that no entity can control, so that we, the individuals, have control of our funds, of our assets, of our data, and that that, that structure, a decentralized structure, is what's necessary if we're to grapple with some of these core problems about access and rent seeking, and, and, and fundamentally, you know, cybersecurity as well, as a, as a core problem in the way that the digital economy functions. So it really is a different mindset, right? This is not, this is, this sector and the, the people that are trying to build services on top of that and are involved in this thing, they're really coming at it very, very differently. Right? It's not just how do I make existing services more efficient, it's like how do we start with a different platform, a different infrastructure. It's a little bit like you know, the early days of the internet. There's, there was a very different information sharing platform that came along once TCPIP was created that allowed people to reimagine business models. But you know what? It's been let's see, 10 years now since Bitcoin was announced. Uh, and you, know, you heard some of the history there in that quiz, actually. And to some extent, it's been a little disappointing. We haven't, we haven't got quite the traction. It's not to say that there aren't incredible ideas being thrown out there and all sorts of momentum. And you would, if you heard me this morning, I'm saying that I think that what's happening with Libra, what's happening with central banks and others, is, is, a, is an example that things are moving actually faster than we, than we understand. That as much as it looks like crypto's you know, staying in one place, and we just heard a gentleman on stage talking about how merchants aren't demanding this, the reality is that there's massive disruption that's happening. And I, I, I personally feel that once Libra, Libra and, and China get going, that the impact indirectly on other currencies is going to be really powerful. And we're going to see a decentralized push emerge as almost as an alternative to these centralized models. But having said that, 10 years, it's been a wild ride for those who've been writing this sort of stuff. Um, so the next panel is one in which we're just going to just explore that journey. So there's a few people who've, who've been involved in this space for quite a while. Some of them are quite well known in this space. Um, and they're going to talk tales from the crypt, the stories, because some of the stories are legendary in this space. This is a a, you know, I think it's fair to say a Wild West kind of environment. It's a frontiers type technology. The early days of, of pretty much any technology often produce these kinds of stories. Individuals that make a lot of money, lose a lot of money, come up with crazy harebrained ideas. There's lots of scammers. There's all sorts of, it's an inherent part, if you like, almost an unavoidable part of the massive amount of disruption that comes with this. So we're going to kind of explore some of those stories. Are, are we all mic'd up back there, guys? Need to check here for a second. You guys all ready? Yeah. All right, we got, we got Vinny Lingham. Vinny's a, a multiple serial entrepreneur involved in the crypto space for a long time. Same words can be applied to Brock Pierce. Thanks, mate. Michael. They have you along. And Martin Paris is going to moderate this panel. Uh, we may be bringing in a, a third, but for the time being, it's the two of you. Okay, excellent. Take it away, guys. Yeah, Brock and I were here last year, um, and it's such a thrill to be joined by Vinny. Uh, Charlie had a last minute thing come up, he couldn't join us, but we're being joined by somebody at some point uh, who also has some crazy tales from the early days. Uh, I don't know if you guys need an introduction to Brock or Vinny, but I thought maybe I would just let you guys introduce yourselves. Brock. Uh, by way of background, how I ended up in this space is I grew up as a gamer. And so in the 90s, 
that was buying, selling, trading Magic the Gathering cards, you know, Pokemon cards, things of that nature. And when the, the first video games started to become networked or massively multiplayer, I recognized that these intangible assets or objects, whether it be digital money, swords, whatever, had value. And so I was a, an early market maker in digital currencies back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, started a company called IGE, which became the largest sort of market maker in the pre-Bitcoin uh, economies of digital money. We built up a supply chain of about 400,000 people that would play video games professionally to mine digital assets in games like World of Warcraft and EverQuest. We were PayPal's largest merchant for years, Google's largest advertiser for a little while. Uh, we were uh, a principal, uh, probably the main partner in launching Alipay in China in the beginning, and we did tens of billions of dollars of business doing that prior to Bitcoin. And so naturally, as we learned how to decentralize uh, uh, these types of activities, the, the opportunities went beyond that of the virtual world and into uh, the real. And I took that red pill uh, early on, and I've been in this space full time since 2012, uh, was a uh, founding board member of MasterCoin, where we invented the ICO. Uh, co-founder of Blockchain Capital, which was the first ventures fund in the space. Uh, co-founder of Tether, which was the first stablecoin in the space. Uh, put together Bcap, which was the first security token in the space. And 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 and, and I don't want to bore you. That's yeah, uh, hopefully I, a sufficient introduction. I just realized I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> I don't know if Mike, Michael did, but uh, and I've interviewed Brock before on the fact that crypto has its roots in gaming. It's pretty fascinating. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, but uh, you started out in gaming and became one of the crypto pioneers even before Mt. Gox. Um, it probably was given the idea for Mt. Gox. Well, I wonder if Jed Well, that's what Mt. Gox was. Right. Mt. Gox was originally a very, very, very small competitor of mine because it stood for Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. It was an exchange for trading in Magic the Gathering cards, the online version uh, from Wizards of the Coast. And then they pivoted into Bitcoin. That's right. Right. And, and by the way, everybody, um, so I'm a freelance tech reporter. I write for Fast Company and VentureBeat, but I also cover crypto for Coindesk and The Block and Modern Consensus and a host of other crypto sites. Um, and uh, what um, you guys did in the early days is that you founded the Bitcoin Foundation, right? So I wasn't a founder of the Bitcoin Foundation. I was uh, elected uh, to the Bitcoin Foundation uh, in the 2014 oh, uh, oh, elections. Okay. And then uh, Vinny also uh, uh, was uh, elected uh, to the board of the Bitcoin Foundation. So neither of us were founders, but we've served on that board uh, uh, for a number of years and uh, you know, always doing everything we can to support this community. So, great. Okay, well, Vinny, you come from the payment space. Tell us how you became involved in crypto. Sure. So, I played World of Warcraft <laughs> back in the days. And I remember when I heard about Bitcoin, and I was trying to figure out this whole mining thing. This is back in 2010. I'm like, yeah, I can't see us winning. This. I can't see making any money out of this because, uh, you know, in, in World of Warcraft, the Chinese miners dominated everything. So, you had to go buy the coins from them. I was like, this is not going to work. I was right. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so I didn't get into Bitcoin back in 2010, uh, but in 20, 2012, um, I was starting a payment startup called Gift, and we were trying to do gift cards uh, online and building a mobile app for gift cards. And one of the biggest problems we had was that credit cards were just unreliable as a payment mechanism for accepting uh, payments for gift cards, because the moment as a merchant, you take the funds off the card, the customer wants the, the gift card, but you have up to six months where there could be a chargeback on that credit card and the, and the consumer can claim it was fraud. And so we had just a ton of fraud in the early days of, of gift. It was, it was pretty bad. And because we were a startup, we just didn't have all the tools to, to combat credit card fraud. So I went looking around for another solution. I was like, well, how do I get people to buy gift cards from us from anywhere in the world, because we sold Amazon cards and people, it was a huge demand for that outside the US. And what we found was that um, a virtual currency like Bitcoin could work well because it was, you know, it was non-reversible. Every transaction was guaranteed and we knew that we could issue the gift card literally within a second of getting the Bitcoins. 
uh, and we did that. And we, we launched the product in, uh, we launched Bitcoin in 2013 on the GIF platform, and we quickly became one of the biggest, in fact, we became the biggest uh, online seller or recipient of, of, of Bitcoin. Uh, as an example, at one point, five percent of all blockchain transactions were going to gift of Bitcoin blockchain transactions were going into the gift platform. Uh, we got acquired by First Data, which is the largest payments company in the world, in 2014, and uh, I, I spent 18 months there through the IPO, handing over, uh, and then I left to go and start Civic, which, you know, basically one of the other use cases of of blockchains I felt was identity and how you could decentralize the keys for identity. Uh, and we started that in 2015, late 2015, early 2016, did an ICO in 2017, and we're launching version two of our product in uh, about two or three months' time. So, so this, this panel is called the Untold Stories, right? Yeah. So everything we've just told you is already known. Um, uh, just you know, hearing Vinny go through this story, because you know, I've, I've been along watching you know, as, a, as, a, as a friend, as a, as, a, as a colleague advisor. and all these things throughout all this stuff. Uh, back during the gift days, you know, Vinny and I were connected through Bill Lee, right? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. how we got to know each other. Bill Lee is a iconic, kind of secretive, but super uh, king-making angel investor in the Bay Area as, you, as he was adding Bitcoin. And uh, we came to an agreement on me being like the last investor in the gift round as you were adding Bitcoin to the piece. And... Uh, I don't think we got in because I think the, yeah. literally in the time that we came to an agreement and the week that the money was supposed to be going in. We got a term sheet from First Data. <laughs> and so I was supposed to be the last investor, but the company sold like hotcakes. Yeah, we were just growing so fast. And, and uh, it, was, you know, it, was, uh, it was one of those like, we, we, we said yes to a whole bunch of people and now there's this term sheet and our existing investors like, you can't take any more money. So like, oh crap. <laughs> so eventually we sold the company. But, but having said that, Brock was instrumental in the founding of Civic. He was one of my first investors in, on board. Uh, he helped us tremendously. So before 2017, before the rush, everything went crazy, no one believed in the space. Like literally, there were very few angel investors around. There were very few funds around. Um, the community was very small, very tightly knit. And we all knew each other. And we didn't, like, when we raised the, the, the seed round for Civic, it was $2.75 million. I mean, that's nothing in today's money, right? But that was, you know, 2015. And that's, I've just come off a $50 million plus exit. We kept the, the round small. But there just weren't, like, people slushing money around in crypto. They didn't believe in crypto. And so that money didn't last long. We, we, we used it up for about a year. And we, were, we were basically getting to the point where we needed more capital. And Brock's the first guy who's, whose door I knocked on. In fact, he's the guy who said, Vinny, I'm going to just give you a half million dollar term sheet right now. Go fill up a round. Let's just keep going. And that saved the company. So we were, you know, we were basically um, you know, running out of cash. And we needed people who believed in blockchain at that point. And there was no one around, like literally. And Brock was one of the guys who stepped up. And he was the guy who stepped up for us. And... Um uh, I guess what else uh, uh, was interesting through that period? Uh, were you also? I, I, you were one of the original LPs in blockchain capital, right? Yeah, yeah I was one so, of the first ones. So yeah. uh, blockchain capital, which was the first fund in the space, initially started out basically as it wasn't really intended to be a fund in the beginning. It was basically me going around to my friends with a hat mm -hmm. and telling everyone, "Throw fifty grand in here." And so, like twenty-five friends all threw fifty thousand dollars each in a hat, and I said. We're gonna go, and everyone help, but you know, I'm gonna go find every new good-looking startup. He and ambushed, give each me, one 25 he to ambushed me at lunch. He's like, Vin, let's go grab lunch. So I get to lunch, he's like, okay, I've got a piece of this pie for you. You're gonna give me a check right now. I'm like, okay, fine. So I pulled out my checkbook. I actually had it on me for some reason, and I gave him a check on the spot. And uh, yeah, it was because, at that point, it was a million dollar first round, all right? That's right. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was nothing. Yeah, it was a tiny yeah, little thing. For a fund. Yeah, the concept, though, it, it, I like to use a Japanese concept as a way of, you know, sort of tipping my hat to, to Satoshi. And so, how many of you are familiar with this concept of karitsu? Um, and that was the idea. It was a really tiny little industry, tight knit. Yeah. And the idea was, how do you build bridges between all of the founders? You know, in most industries, everyone's looking at, you know, the other person in the industry as their competitor. They view them as a threat, you know, because everybody's like in their, their land grab phase and the, the ideology or the philosophy behind this vehicle, we charge no fees. So I did all of this work for free, as did my partners, Bart and Brad Stevens. But the idea was, how do we facilitate 
connections? How do we facilitate bonds amongst the small number of people that are trying to build this industry? And everybody putting money into this vehicle together, which then would go out, essentially was a mechanism to create diversification. All of a sudden, Vinny was a, you know, a shareholder in 10 or 20 of that entire vintage of startups that launched in 2013 and 14. Um, and Coinbase. Yeah, and all of a sudden now yeah. you're sitting down with everybody else. Oh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm in your company too. Oh, yeah, you're in mine. And everybody, it, it, it just enabled... Uh, uh, the ecosystem, right, to grow. Yeah, it, 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 it enabled good conversations. It facilitated, you know, relationship where instead of, you know, your first reaction being fear-based and threat-based, it's like, oh, I have upside in you. And all of a sudden, you, you've kind of broken through that first phase of that, call it, relationship building process. And I think that's a, you know, something that, back to untold stories, is something that the industry, you know, as an outsider, you know, how did we get here? Because it was tiny, as Vinny is saying. And there were very few people that believed in this. You know, most people thought we were crazy or we were doing something really shady. <laughs> and, uh... I, actually, I miss those days. I really do. Like, the industry got overridden by a lot of greed in 2017, 2018 even. And in the early days, it wasn't about the money. It was about, like, how do we build something meaningful? How do we build really cool stuff people can use? How can we change the world? And then, the, the, you know, the narrative shift to how are we, how are we all going to become billionaires overnight? And that, and that was really bad, really bad for the industry and set us back many years. And we're still paying the price. I want to bring you guys back to the founding of Blockchain Capital. I interviewed um, Bart and Brad uh, Stevens, your, your founding partners in Blockchain Capital, and they told me this wonderful story about what was going on in Silicon Valley at the time, that uh, you know, no bank really would back any of the crypto startups except for Silicon Valley Bank, which Not banked... Back. They wouldn't let you bank. 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 They wouldn't bank, bank. Right. right? We're not they talking like investment. They said, "Sorry, <laughs> right, right. we won't let. We Sorry. won't take your money. You're not right. allowed to work with us." Except Silicon Valley Bank, yeah. right? They were they were the first one to bite for Coinbase, um, and and he told me this. The the guys told me this wonderful story about YPO. Do you want to tell the audience about YPO with Mickey? Um, Mickey, Mickey Malta, Malta, yeah. Mickey Malta and, right. and 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 Wences Caceres. Yeah, well, these are unsung heroes. Mickey Malta is a name that I imagine most people in crypto today have never heard of. And even some of the people that were around going back in the day may not have heard of because generally quiet, non-assuming, but he was the first serious VC to really kind of get big time behind this industry. Wrote the original sort of analytical reports that got circled around, uh, you know, got passed around amongst the who's who. Uh, he was co-founder with Wences Cesaris of Zappo back in the day. They started back in Internet 1.0, a bank in Latin America, uh, a digital bank, which they exited. And he started a firm called Ribbit, like a frog would ribbit, ribbit, uh, ribbit capital. And, and actually the hugely audience, successful. the audience might know Ribbit and Zappo because they're Libra. They're founding members of Libra. Yes. So they're back in the spotlight. But, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 unsung hero in the case of Mickey Malta. Um, yeah, the, and, and it was through those guys and, and Wences going around to Larry and Sergey and call it the who's who of Silicon Valley through channels like Young Presidents Organization and others that really kind of took Bitcoin from call it, you know, one to ten dollars from to ten to a hundred. It was, you know, people with credibility that were incredibly well respected like Mickey and Wences that didn't come from the United States, that came from places like Argentina, where financial systems collapse. Mm -hmm. You know, as Americans, you know, the, you know, I mean, I remember back in the early days, I'd be out at a dinner, I'd be at a restaurant, and we'd, you know, someone would be, Bitcoin would become part of the conversation. And, you know, the table next to me would, you know, hear Bitcoin and, or something. And you'd, you'd always get someone that, like, thought they knew something about this industry because they've read half an article, but they read the headline, which had been sensational. And they'd want to, like, you know, start a fight. They'd be like, oh, I know about Bitcoin. Uh, and I, I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> we're having dinner, but okay. Yeah, what, 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 what would you like to discuss? And they're like, yeah, it's, it's, it's really shady. Da -da 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 -da. And I'm like, okay. And then they're like, yeah, so tell me why I should want Bitcoin. They're like, you know, it's like, okay, why, why am I here to convince you? But I'd have fun with it. And, you know, the, the game I'd play is... Uh, tell me bits I took, dude. Yeah, re reverse psychology. Yeah. Betting is one of the good ones. But I tried to, I tried to, to go through this process, which is relevant to what Wences and, and, and Mickey did, which they say, 
why should I want Bitcoin? And I would say, you shouldn't. And they're like, what do you mean I shouldn't? I go, well, it's not for you. And they're like, what do you mean not for me? And I go, well, do you have a bank account? And they're like, yeah. And I go, and I'm guessing you've got a piece of plastic in your pocket that lets you conveniently pay for things too. And they're like, yeah. And I go, yeah, you probably have faith in the system. And you have one of the 200 currencies in the world that everyone wants more of. But did you know that two thirds of the population of the world are on or underbanked? Did you know in places like Latin America, a major economy goes bust every like seven years and you go to log into your bank account that day and it says zero no matter how much money you had in it the day before? You know, it's like this confused thing. I go, this is a technology that is largely about creating financial inclusion in the world. You know, you, this, you're not our target audience. You know, if you lived in Latin America, Africa, or Southeast Asia, you'd probably understand why this is important and why it has the potential to change your life. And after that, you know, you got them to think. Because, you know, we sometimes take for granted all of the blessings and the wonderful things that we have being in such a, a place as we are right now. Brock, I want to I take you way back, um, way back to Mt. Gox and Silk Road and what happened with Charlie, because Charlie couldn't be here. And if you can just share with us untold stories from that era, Charlie being the first Bitcoiner to take the fall for the revolution and so forth. Yeah, Charlie, Charlie Schrem was the, uh, uh, the founder of BitInstant, which was um, kind of a precursor to Coinbase you know, could very well be Coinbase today if it hadn't uh, uh, fallen apart and he hadn't gotten indicted and gone to jail. <laughs> but um, Roger, Ver, <laughs> Roger Ver, uh, who was always known as, as Bitcoin Jesus, now some refer to him as Bitcoin Judas, um, inappropriate considering how much this person has done for the industry, whether you agree or disagree with what he does today and his position on Bitcoin Cash or otherwise, uh, uh, a luminor luminary that has done more for this industry than anyone that joins today likely ever could. He calls himself Bitcoin Appleseed. <laughs> and so, I mean, I mean let, let's just expand on that for one for, for for a second because I think it's fair to give people a perspective on things. Back in those days, okay, Bitcoin was about spending it, moving it around, using it as digital money, so we could actually you know buy gift cards, etc. There was a whole narrative around this is peer-to-peer -peer money. All the all the Merchants were starting to adopt it, accept it. There was liquidity pools that were growing around this, and it was a form of money. Uh, the narrative shifted considerably in 2014, 2015, when uh, it shifted to this is a store of value, and therefore everyone should hold it, not spend and not use the Bitcoin uh, because it's going to go up in price. And the, the digital money narrative fell away. And this is where the, the split came between Roger, Bitcoin Cash, and Bitcoin. Bitcoin Cash says, uh, you know, the view there is that it's digital money, it should be moved around, it shouldn't be, be hoarded, and Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin community believes it should be hoarded. And so he was ostracized because he, he kept to the narrative that was, at the time, the original narrative for Bitcoin, and the new narrative is the gold one. Even though it's, you know, it's five or six years, that is the, the branch of Bitcoin that it did actually change from digital, gold, from digital money to digital gold. And we had a digital money talk, so... I think it's important to just point out that there was a, a narrative shift, and now there's two. Well, in this room, he's he's you know this is more, this this is more his panel. Yeah. Um, and, and whatever your opinion is, Roger mm. has been instrumental in helping the industry get to where it is. Um, and it it pains me when I see you know I was I, we, people that were there and watched how hard yeah. and how principled you know these people were, and to see how you know sometimes people spit on them. <laughs> You know, take a look at Gavin, who uh, was the successor to Satoshi uh, at the Bitcoin Foundation. I mean, he barely works in the industry today because of how he's been mistreated. And this is a guy that could have been co-founder of Coinbase or any company he wanted. Pick of the litter. But he chose to never compromise his integrity and never took an advisory share, joined a single company, worked tirelessly and for free as a humble servant to this industry. And it's just like, it, it pains me. So I like to talk mm -hmm. about these things for people that mm -hmm. you know, are curious about the origin story. And so back to, to Charlie Schrem. So Roger's like, Brock, you know, you've done all this business stuff before and you know, I, I, I need you to really like get to know Charlie Schrem. I want you to help help him with Bits, Bit Instant and you know, how to deal with his investors and how to get this company going. I'm like, yeah, no problem. And so it was January of, I think, 2014. 
And so uh, the, this is the Bitcoin Miami conference, uh, 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 which is the main kind of Bitcoin thing, which is coming up around the corner. Blockchain week is one week away. So it's basically, this is the anniversary. And so Roger, Charlie, and I are supposed to sit down because he was Charlie's main investor, along with the Winklevoss brothers. And, uh, and I was supposed to figure out how to help. So we get there. And so Roger and I are sitting there. Charlie didn't show up. And you know, a little more time goes by, and Charlie still hasn't shown up. And Roger's starting to get a little aggravated, you know, because he's like, you know, main investor along with the the Winklevi, and you know, he's like facilitated this meeting, and he's feeling a little embarrassed because you know I got other things to do, you know, and you know, finally he's just like, I don't know what to say, and you know, kind of this this meeting we wrap up, you know, hug and you know, but kind of angry. It turns out that Char this is when Charlie got arrested. <laughs> We were the first meeting he was supposed to have, and so the reason he didn't show up is he was in cuffs <laughs> in a jail cell. So he had a legitimate excuse <laughs> to not show up on that day. <laughs> um, oh, God, insane. Uh, you know, but these are, yeah, Poor stories Tom. that have never, never been told in front of an audience before. And so I, I think that was the, you know, sort of the intent. And, you know, it's a, it is a tight-knit community. And, you know, any one of us that's been around for a long time on the front lines, you know, tip of the spear... Uh, uh, building, pioneering, innovating, disrupting, uh, bridge building. Uh, there's a lot of war stories. <laughs> so, yeah. So, Charlie goes to jail and we go into a crypto winter, right? Didn't, wasn't that when the government came down on money laundering and the, right after the run-up and it was like quiet for a while? It was our build Well, time. there's a bunch of things that happened around happened? that same time, yeah. right? Mount Gox. Uh, hack. Of course, right. Uh, 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 obviously, this is the first time, yeah, government sort of action was taken, Silk Road, you know, all of these things sort of happened around the same time. And uh, it's the same thing that we've experienced with this, this industry. It's always through going through yep. these cyclical cycles, um, uh, which is why I don't ever advise people to buy crypto, you know, other than maybe $100 worth, buy something nominal as a way of learning about it. I tell people to invest in themselves, invest in their you know, in, in, you know, education so that you're equipped for, call it the world of tomorrow, you know, but make informed decisions for yourself. Um, but definitely, you know, if anything we've seen, don't be you know, making your bet during a big run up. You know? uh, the right time to be doing is probably averaging your way in over time in those bear markets. You guys are both part of the Bitcoin Foundation now. You're the chair. You're on the board. I'm right. Charlie was one of the founders. Yeah, Charlie. Char Charlie Schrem was one of the founders and original board members. Mm -hmm. He had to resign after, you know. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, like with Roger <laughs> and Eric Voorhees and those guys? Is yeah, right? Roger was uh, involved in the founding as well, uh, but probably the original main sponsor. Uh, uh, of, of, the, of the foundation, as was Mark Carpellis, the founder, not the founder, but the owner and CEO of Mt. Gox, uh, Jed McCaleb, uh, the founder of Ripple, or co-founder of Ripple, and Stellar was the founder of Mt. Gox. You know, lightning has struck three times for him. Right. So, um, incredible. Uh, Vinny, you come on board in the kind of the mid-period. Um, when we're having like, uh, what do they call it? Uh, hard wars over hard forks or something like that. Do you, do you want to share any stories from that time period? I mean, the, 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 it was a big, you know, obviously 2017 was where the, where the narrative hard forked. <laughs> you know, because the, the narrative started building up that Bitcoin was, so the, just so, like this, this is a complex topic. It's hard to sort of condense. Um, you know, when you look at the Bitcoin system as it is today, uh, it's being engineered so that everyone in the world can run a node, realistically. And that means that every one of you would want to run one, etc. And the, the reason for that is because as you increase the, the transaction count in Bitcoin, you need to have more, you know, b slightly bigger computers, more storage, etc. And so the narrative is that, look, in order to keep the, the system as decentralized as possible, so everyone in the world can run a node, you have to keep the block size really small, and you have to create layer two networks like Lightning on top of it to uh, allow for settlement of transactions. Um, that was a very big change from what initially, I believe, and, and a, lot of, a lot of the old sort of OGs in the space believe was that you would just increase the block size to a certain point, and because you know, not everyone in the world is gonna run a node, Realistically, if you look at how many nodes there are today, 5,000 out of, what, 50 million people? Uh, I, I can't see that scaling uh, to everyone in the world running a node one day, that, that whole narrative. So, you know, effectively, there was just different philosophies that went different ways. You've got, you've got the Bitcoin SV people who think that, node, that, that blocks should be unlimited and 
20 gigs or whatever it is, and you have the Bitcoin Cash, which is, I don't know, 32 now or something, and then you've got the Bitcoin, which is one megabyte plus, you know, they've got this notion of a block weight uh, as well. And it, it's just different philosophies around engineering and uh, it's the different ideologies around, you know, what, what digital money should look like. And so it's, I still think it's too soon to tell how it plays out. I think uh, what's definitely happened is you've had, at one point, I wrote a blog post about this in 2014, you actually had Bitcoin, which everyone is getting behind and rallying behind, and you wouldn't have had this whole altcoin revolution or explosion if Bitcoin increased the block size, because a lot of the alts came as a result of the, 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 the scaling limitations of Bitcoin. Um, but Bitcoin has proved to be the, you know, the, the, the sort of big gorilla in the room over a long period of time. So it's got that going for it. The real question is like, when do we get over 20,000? When do we see the next bull run? And this bear market is, nearly, I think, another less than 12 more months for it to be the longest bear market in Bitcoin. What about the halving? So, the, the, you know, so there's two schools of thought in halving as well. The one school of thought is that it's, it's priced in, because if you look at efficient market uh, theory and hypo hypotheses, um, the halving's priced in. It's a, it's a known event. It's and it's half the last halving. Yeah, yeah. And the inflation is only 1.8%. I wrote about this four years ago on the last halving. And so it's known. So the only thing that can make the price go up really is an unknown because it should, in theory, be priced in. But a lot of people disagree. A lot of people think that there are going to be mechanical changes to the industry when the, the supply gets taken out. I think this is a very dangerous year for Bitcoin, personally. And that, like, I, I think that having been through this a number of times, this is one of the years where um, you know, things can go really wrong or really right. And we'll see. Yeah, the halving might not be great for price. It could have the opposite impact in the sense that, um, yeah, but the forking, it's, that's one of the beauties of this entire, you know, sort of industry at its core, right? The philosophy is this, this concept of open source, you know, and forking isn't bad. I mean, we are all forks, you know, we're the forks of our parents, right? Um, and, uh, you know, we have, you know, consensual uh, <laughs> and contentious forks. <laughs> um, and so this, uh, uh, you know, this is where the contention, yeah. you know, is. But, you know, from an open source sort of perspective, I mean, that's the beauty of all of this, mm -hmm. is if we disagree and enough people agree with me, you know, we can take our ball and go across the street and say, we're going to go do it our way. Yeah. In, in every other having up to now, the Bitcoin price has moved to accommodate the miners mining uh, and, and, and protecting the chain from a security perspective. So in theory, it should happen again. But if it doesn't, we're going to have security problems, right? We're going to have hash power leaving the chain. There's lots of things that can happen. Uh, funny enough, Brian from Coinbase, he wrote a, a, about- Brian Armstrong. Mm -hmm. Brian Armstrong from Coinbase. He wrote about some of the dangers at the last halving, which never actually materialized um, because the Bitcoin price actually moved to accommodate the, the halving. If it doesn't, this time, we have a different set of variables to look at. What do you think about the mythology? It's untold stories, the mythology around Satoshi. I see, Brock, if you want to show everybody what you're wearing on your hat, Pokemon. <laughs> um, um, uh, one of the theories, um, uh, which Craig Wright would agree with, um, <laughs> to just make things a little spicy or controversial, um, uh, one of the theories of the name Satoshi Nakamoto. Nakamoto is a Japanese philosopher, uh, which you can look up, worth studying. And uh, the name Satoshi came from gaming, you know, in this theory. Um, Satoshi is the main character in Pokemon. Uh, in English, that character is known as Ash, you know, the main trainer. Pikachu, obviously, is the, the Pokemon, but the trainers are the, 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 the people. And so Satoshi is the name of the main character in Pokemon. And there's another character in Pokemon uh, named Brock, which is the trainer that taught Satoshi, you know, kind of <laughs> most of what he knows. And so that's uh, why I, I have that card in my hat. Amazing. And then... Along with a feather. <laughs> Vinny, you're, you're wearing the Freedom shirt uh, from our libertarian, from Bitcoin's libertarian roots. Uh, do you have any stories to tell about, like, kind of how you fell into the, the movement, so to speak? You know, it's kind of hard when you run a privacy company and keep everything secret. Um, <laughs> no, look, uh, you know, back to the Satoshi thing, I, I spent a lot of time digging through the archives on Satoshi, like literally read all his texts, all his words. Um, I, I, I've got some theories on, on which I'm, I'm not going to share today. Oh, why? Uh, it's untold stories. On the person or where the name came from? Uh, uh, probably the, more the person. Okay. Uh, um, or the persons. Yeah, well, so, so I, I will say that I, I, it was definitely not one person. 
there was definitely multiple people in Satoshi, in, in my opinion. Uh, he, he, you know, it was a pseudonym used, and he even the reason he or she said is because they referenced the, the, the group as we. We. It was never, you know, like he may have written in certain forums, but it was always we. And uh, there's, there's a couple other reasons why I, I really believe it was a group of people. Um, I actually do believe that, that they're active in the industry in some way. I have to believe that, that uh, one or more of them are active in the industry at the moment where, you know, maybe just quietly in the background contributing code or whatever it is. Um, for lots of reasons, they oh, wouldn't want to Oh, you mean like one of the Bitcoin core developers? Who knows? Uh. Who knows? My, my guess is that they're there somewhere. It may not be. Bitcoin. How many are they? Huh? We don't know. We don't uh, know. I, I, you know I, I think some people would say Legion, right? You know, when, when people are like, you know, you know, who is Satoshi? I always like to say, we are all Satoshi. If you've <laughs> chosen to get involved in this mission, it's kind of like in that movie V for Vendetta. You know, the very the very end of the movie. You know, have you put on the mask? Yeah. So are you part of this? Movement? Here's a question for you, Brock. If Satoshi came into the market today and he said, you know, I don't, I don't agree with this and that, do you think people would follow him or would just keep going the same path we're on right now? Do you think the industry would move to what he was saying or would, would, we just wouldn't listen? I, I don't think anyone would listen at this point. I mean, uh, yeah. Satoshi is... I, I agree. Satoshi has become almost a messiah-like yeah. fi figure. And anytime you put uh, 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 an elusive sort of character archetype on a pedestal that high. He, he would, there's he nothing, would, he would there's nothing that can happen other than disappointment. And, 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 and in that disappointment, uh, there would always be controversy uh, and there would always be a large number of people that would say, I don't believe it. <laughs> I, 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 I agree. If we put someone who was Satoshi in front of it, let's just say it was narrowed down to one person who's the main person or whatever, I don't believe anyone would believe that would be Satoshi. Even if he had the keys, I don't think anyone would believe it. I and, don't think, and I don't think he would look the way we think he looks or act the way he or she thinks. You know, like, I just think that our perception of what Satoshi is is very, very, very far away from the reality of who this person is. And therefore, I think it would just be disbelief. And they, if it was a they, likely made an oath to each other that they would never do that. Mm, interesting. Forever anonymous. How cool is that? Being anonymous. To their deathbeds is anonymous I, likely how that story <laughs> could have gone. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, last question, very quickly, because uh, we're out of time. You know, this is the year of Libra, and big tech goes banking. Um, what do you think the untold story is going to be about this year? <laughs> you well, had your well, crystal ball. Li 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 Libra is probably very far away from going live. Oh, you I, I don't think it will go live this year. Okay. I'd be so super surprised. I mean, unless they renege on what they said, they would say, like, you know, Facebook has said they need to get regulatory approval from all, all the regulators. I cannot see every regulator in the U.S. getting on board and approving Libra this year. Like, if you're not in an election year, it's just not going to happen. Though, I, if, you see, if you checked out the news today, Trump uh, did uh, uh, announce, based upon his last dinner with Mark Zuckerberg, that he's the number one user on Facebook or the number one most... Uh, Commented. I don't know in what. I don't know what number one in that case means, but um, <laughs> uh, that was in the in the in the press today. So uh, I think good lobbying on Mark Zuckerberg's part. I, I I think that Libra is a good thing for the industry. I've always said the same thing when Jamie Dimon, you know, got into doing J.P. Morgan coin. You know, I've always said that these are good things for the industry. You know, when when the banking world has validated us as a sector saying that we're not just a bunch of crazies, we're not just a bunch of dreamers, that, but the technology and the things that we're building and the work that we're doing is real. That is a huge validation. I mean, the banking industry has agreed that this is real and it has the potential to be a very big deal. That's a good thing. How is JP Morgan coin doing? I, I don't think very well, but I'm not following it very closely, but I think that was very important and critical validation for us as an ecosystem. And the reason it's not doing very well is because banks don't really understand tech. They don't understand consumer tech. I mean, how many of you are happy with your, your bank's uh, uh, mobile application? Probably uh, none would be my guess. Um, you know, obviously the Facebooks of the world are much better suited to play in this field but they're also much more qualified to validate 
you know, the significance of what we're doing. You know, I'll listen to Mark Zuckerberg a hundred times more than I would listen to Jamie Dimon when we're talking about tech and consumer tech and, and, and as a platform to really drive distribution in the world. So again, in the same way, I think this is an incredibly big, very powerful validation for us as an ecosystem. I think that we should Except be- Except it's not anonymous. That's no, the and, well, and, that's, and, and, and likely gonna have a lot of, I, I, the likelihood of Libra being the winner or the thing is I think relatively low. Um, but I think as an industry, uh, a, a, an overall a good thing for all of us. They've certainly, I mean, for guys like us, they've become the target. You know, they're certainly taking most of the regulatory arrows right now and having to fight most of our battles. So, I mean, that's great for, I think, most of the entrepreneurs in this space because regulatory battles and regulatory conversations are very expensive. You know, startups are not banks. Well, they don't as, have endless resources. As investors, I think what's interesting is that if Facebook spurs on Libra and, you know, Google responds and Amazon responds and everyone else responds, all of a sudden, as an investor, we're investors in a ton of companies in the space. They're going to get acquired. They're going to, you know, any other company looking to get in the space, a company with Facebook to start buying up these firms, looking at more advanced blockchains that they can use, et cetera. So I think it's good overall. If, if we can get through the, the, the bear market and we come out with a M&A sort of drive because the big guys need to start investing money heavily in the space, that's great for, great for the industry, great for the investors, great for the entrepreneurs. I can't thank you guys enough. I'm bringing Robin back on stage because you guys are right. pioneers. And uh, so I've got one message to them. And, and um, it is really that um, you are gracious. I am an old person. I've seen a couple of revolutions. One was called the internet. It revolutionized everything. And the first time I heard them speak, I said, can, I, can you teach me what, what you know? And you know, uh, age blind, color blind, gender blind, they have created a community. And so I made the dorkiest present ever for both of you. Uh, oh, a little beautiful. acknowledgement <laughs> of your contributions as crypto pioneers. Oh, thank oh, you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> thank you so oh, much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, right, my DIY uh, diplomas. There you go. Um, do we have our for Right. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank they you are. to everyone for thank taking everyone. the time out of your day to listen to, to, listen to some of our old war stories. <laughs>